we're thinking about international organizations and international cooperation, we really have to um, have a look at the prospects for the European Union. Because really, for the past 70 years, the European Union has in many respects been the model of what can be accomplished internationally in cooperation between states. Uh, I think about it. Um, after, after going to war three times in 70 years, um, it's now inconceivable that France and Germany will go to war with one another. A lot of that responsibility, people think, lies with the European Union. It's also, of course, led to massive economic benefits and so on. Um, so we want to ask the question, um, what are the prospects for the European Union? Of course, in recent years, it, it's not looked so great, um, uh, in particularly because of Brexit. So what are the prospects for the European Union? Why is it so important? Well, again, um, first, it's, it's size and wealth. Uh, over 350 million people in the European Union. Um, and if you take it all together, right, it's, it's a bigger economy than even the United States. Um, it's also important well beyond its borders, largely because the European states uh, were some of the main uh, colonial powers, and therefore they still have a lot of ties to the global south, and so a lot of influence beyond their borders. Um, it's potentially important um, because of the diminished prestige of the United States in the world. Uh, if the United States role goes down, either because others don't respect it anymore or because the United States just withdraws, that leaves more room for the European Union. Um, and in particular because it's seen as such a successful model that um, other regions around the world have tried to do things that emulate the European Union, and so far most of them have not been able to come close. Um, so its claims to success, they're big ones, right? The economic growth since World War II has been spectacular, and as new members have joined over the years, they have all seen a boost in growth. So it's seen as uh, economic magic. Uh, it's successfully promoted democracy to the post-communist states. If you go to the Czech Republic now or Slovakia or a bunch of other countries that in my lifetime were, were more author authoritarian than, than it's really easy to imagine now, they're booming democracies. Um, Increasingly, uh, as I talked about in the previous uh, video, they're increasingly supranational rather than intergovernmental. So there's this idea, which some people are afraid of and some people love, right? There, right there's this idea that it's inching its way towards becoming the United States of Europe. And uh, as I've already mentioned, it's taken a, a region that for centuries was one war after another, and it's essentially made it um, a, a zone of peace. Um, which if, if, if none of those other things were accomplished, that would be seen as a major benefit. But it faces some very big challenges uh, right now. Right? One of them is Brexit. The British finally, at the end of 2020, left the um, European Union, and the question is, you know, how does the European Union go forward without the British? Uh, a related challenge is populism. There are, populism has become prevalent in many of the member states of the European Union, and particular, uh, particularly in Hungary, but to a lesser extent in some others, uh, Poland. Um, Hungary is, is getting harder and harder to even define as a democracy, and how the European Union, which was always seen as a club of democracies, uh, how they handle that is quite tricky. And then there are some very profound disagreements about economic policy. Um, so Brexit, why did it happen? How does it hurt the EU? What are the prospects going forward? Um, sorry, Brexit. Uh, well, so why did it happen? It happened because the, the British, who were always um, a little bit less enthusiastic about the EU than some others, uh, there was a wave of populism there in, in 2016. There was a, 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 a the, the, um, the Conservative Party decided it was a popular thing uh, to have a vote on this. Um, and, and for at least many conservatives, a lot of conservatives backed Brexit, many conservatives got something they didn't expect to get which was people actually voted for by a very, very narrow majority, supported, of course, by some interesting uh, propaganda intervention from Russia. Um, but once the decision was, once the vote was made, the British said, okay, this is what we're doing. Um, I won't go through the whole tortured process of negotiating the terms of departure, but it's now happened. Um, ultimately, uh, the British decided they'd rather have more sovereignty and less integration, um, and that they would bear the economic cost of it. Um, how does this hurt the EU? It hurts it really in two ways. It sh you know, Britain's a big country. Um, it shrinks the size of the EU in terms of population, but also in terms of, of economy. And in some respects, it was a blow to EU prestige, and it's given so some support in some other places to the idea of, hey, maybe, maybe we can push back too. Um, at the same time, it's, it's eliminated from the EU 
one big country that was always slowing down deeper integration. And so there are those within the EU who are thinking, good riddance, now maybe we can move faster on some of the things we want to move. And so as far as the prospects going forward, you know, it's hard to predict the future, um, but, but there's a sense that while so, in some countries populists are going to continue to push this anti-EU line, uh, in the EU as a whole, there might be a sense of, okay, without the British, uh, now we can and need to come together even more than before. Particularly in foreign policy as it relates to um, the EU's weight in the world, as it relates to, say, Russia or the United States, uh, the British uh, are definitely going to be missed because uh, Britain has for a very long time had a very close relationship with the United States and in that sense was the part of the European Union that perhaps um, was most effective uh, at dealing with the, the United States. So populism. Uh, as we've already said, populism was a, 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 a cause of Brexit, just this general, we don't like international stuff and we think if we just have everything within Britain, everything will be awesome. Um, that was a big cause of, of Brexit. Some similar sort of things have been going on in other places. Uh, the, the government in Hungary now purports to be what, uh, what it calls an illiberal democracy, which is a political science term to say we're going to be democratic in the sense that the government's going to get elected, but we're not going to be a liberal democracy. We're not necessarily going to protect rights to free speech, uh, free press. Um, we're not necessarily going to have free and fair elections. So illiberal democracy in some respects uh, is probably a, a contradiction in terms. The ruling party in Poland has essentially politicized the judiciary and is also doing things uh, in a lot of ways to, to make it very difficult um, for other institutions in Poland to challenge the ruling party in Poland. And so that's an issue as well. Um, there are some problems in other countries as well. Um, so the question is, on the one hand, can the, can the EU use various measures to force its members to be democratic? And it's had a little bit of success in this respect by denying certain benefits. Um, but it's also had problems doing that because these members, um, it's very easy, I would say, to block policies in the European Union. So when the European Union wants to punish some of these countries, they themselves can often block the measures. And, and if the EU can't force Hungary or Poland sort of back within the democratic fold, then the question is, what does the EU look like and how does it survive with undemocratic members? And, and we don't know the answers to those things. And lastly is economic policy. Um, and this really has to do, going back to the Great, Great Recession, the problem was, was that um, the German economy in particular, which is the biggest economy in the European Union, and Germany is very politically powerful in the Union, the German economy was doing okay, and some of the economies in southern Italy, uh, in southern Europe, including Italy and Greece, were, were really doing badly. And there's always been this, this debate over whether, um, like in any state that's really a single state, right, there would be some efforts um, to tax the overall economy and, and move money towards the, the, the places that were doing most poorly. Uh, there's this division in Europe where the Northern Europeans uh, have a sense that the Southern Europeans have not spent their money wisely, they don't work hard enough, they've, uh, the governments have, have uh, wasted money, and therefore they're saying, we don't wanna, we're not going to have our money used to bail you guys out. And so that's, um, that's been a long-term question as to whether there would be European-wide debt that would be used to bail out some particular regions. Um, that actually uh, was resolved in part by COVID, where due to the economic impact of COVID, the Germans finally agreed that there would be some European debt that would be used to deal with the economic impact of COVID. Now that that um, line has been crossed, it's unclear what the implications would be in the future. Uh, but that's one sign, potential sign at least, that after Brexit, Europe is actually going to, um, to integrate more deeply than it had in the past. We'll have to see. So what are the questions uh, for the future? Big questions. Uh, without the British skepticism, can the EU now integrate more deeply? Um, we'll probably see some of that at least. Without British power, um, does the France-German quote-unquote engine now dominate? One of the great things about having Britain in the European Union was it actually led to a, a broader um, balance of power, we, we might call it, within the Union itself. Um, Germany is by far the biggest economy and the most vibrant economy, and so there's always been a fear within the European Union that Germany would dominate it, and German dominance um, would be even more likely without Britain. 
the same time, um, from the very beginning, it's really been the French-German partnership after World War II that's driven the Union forward. And that engine, that team, might uh, be even stronger without British power. And lastly, there are some challenges from outside, right? The things that are going on in Poland and in Hungary are absolutely being encouraged by Russia where they can. Russia encouraged Brexit, tries to foment instability in various ways. Um, while at the same time, the United States is, is engrossed in its own domestic turmoil. And so there's a question as to does Russia succeed in, in um, sort of dividing the Europeans from one another, or does that challenge uh, renew Europe's resolve to unify? And similarly, with the United States withdrawing to some extent from the world stage, do the Europeans uh, sort of double down and say, okay, now is the time for Europe to leave? There are some signs of that. But it's a, um, it's a question about international cooperation that is also a big question, really, about the future of global politics because the European Union plays such an important role.